Welcome back, everybody. I hope you've had a good tea break, as I said, in the other room. And welcome to all of our watchers and lurkers online. This is our 11.30 seminar. It's our technical seminar, which is um, named for two practitioners from our industry who specialised in amplifiers, electronics and electroacoustics. We have a relative newcomer making a debut performance today, Dr Peter Mapp, <laughs> um, who has given the Warren Barnet probably countless times since its inaugural lecture, and may well have even given the inaugural one, I believe. Yeah, we are. <laughs> okay. Hayden lecture. <laughs> now, <laughs> in advance of um, Peter giving us his paper, which is entitled Myths, Maths and Morphs, I should let you know that Peter has told me in advance he intends to break every single rule that any presenter should follow when giving a seminar. So we should be in for a good ride. Plus, there is audience participation, and it's not optional. So we're expecting you to all be very lively and get involved. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over into the very capable hands of Dr. Peter Mapp. Hi, hey, Alan. <laughs> People were sort of asking me why it was called Myths, Maths, and morphs? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I, I, I have had two operations in the last year, and I think I did this under anaesthesia. So um, <laughs> it seemed funny at the time, but I'm not so sure it's going to work now. The, the, the reason is, in fact, I was going to talk about something completely different, um, but it kind of morphed into what you're going to see today. And during the lecture, things morph from one thing to another. So that's the morphs. Yes, I'm going to put some maths into it because I want to break every rule. You should never, ever talk about maths in one of these lectures, so we'll break that rule. And I'm going to go through a few myths. So what can possibly go wrong? And yes, there may be some audience participation. And again, another thing you should never do when giving one of these talks. Um, so it struck me that we now have some people that maybe not are are not audio-based in, in our membership and come to these lectures, we'll see them. And so therefore I thought I ought to define some of the terms that we use just to make sure everybody's up to the same peg. And so we had the first one. Um, looks of amazement. Well, that's obviously a DB, because you, <laughs> you can see the D. Um, they, they, they get worse, don't worry. Um, so that's a DB. And that's obviously an A-weighted DB. <laughs> uh, so you get that one. Um, and that's a DBC. OK, so, um, so we've got through those. That is a sound source, which we'll be talking about. <laughs> you, 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 you've got to be with it to get these. It's, uh, how long have we got? About two hours? OK. Oh, okay. Uh, we've got 40 minutes. You have locked the doors, haven't you? I have. You? Oh, good. You can't run away. <laughs> no, they can't run away for these. Okay. Um, right, so then there's some other terms and definitions I think we should talk about. Um, that's clearly a headroom problem. Um, if you, you, you need to look at that and think about it, but it, it is a headroom problem. Um, and that is an interesting one, I think, the way that uh, the steps go up or don't go up. Um, so that's obviously a brick wall filter. Um, so that we got rid of that one. Um, and here's another headroom problem uh, in, in real life. Um, so much for machine learning. One of the things we talk about a lot in audio is balance and unbalanced loads. So I need to explain those, I think. Um, there's an example of balanced loads, um, clearly. And... There's an unbalanced load. So you get the picture. And obviously we have to sometimes convert from unbalanced to balanced uh, in audio. And here's an example of that. Which, um, you've got to look at that and think about it. <laughs> um, but I like that one. Uh, OK. So that's one way of doing it, um, I guess. I also want to talk about some planning and thinking ahead when we're doing system design or anything really. 
Um, and I, I'll leave you to, to work these slides out. I'm, I'm not going to come to the end. So, option, there's number one. Just think about what's going on. Still think about what's going on. And, uh, yeah, now, see, a little bit of planning and a group planning or whatever would have sorted that out. No issues. And, obviously, preventative maintenance is also a good idea when we're doing systems. I'm glad you think these are funny, because I thought they were funny, when I, but I was under anesthesia at the time. So. <laughs> um, talking about the need for planning, and just to take another example, um, I think uh, all we can say is that for the physicists in the room, or those that you've seen Oppenheimer and actually understood it, um, Heisenberg was correct in that case. Oh, no, I won't bother into that one then, if you don't get it. Um, and then, um, again, some planning that didn't quite work out on the drawings. And that one. I love that one. So it looked all right in the drawing. How many times have we looked at a drawing and it, everything looks all right or you understand it and then in I walked into rooms going, didn't think it was going to look like that. Um, so yes, so that happens a lot of the time. Um, obviously standards help in, in these situations, but they shouldn't conflict. We, we do spend a lot of time in standards trying to make sure we don't get conflictions between them. And I think there's a couple of good examples of two different standards conflicting. You've got a disabled ramp there, but you also have to have bars uh, and rails down the stairs. Um, and, and obviously you have to have the same thing there. So um, you, you can't believe that people would actually install that. Uh, but, but you do. I never seem to be, <laughs> cease to be amazed at what people do in audio. And there's a video one for, for everybody. Um, uh, yeah, okay. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to bother with this one. It was, it was just a polar measurement. Um, and here's... I like this one, but not a lot. Um, uh, yeah, well, obviously the audio doesn't sound right because it, it's out of sync. Those are the ones you don't like. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Right. Okay. Um, obviously, you know, loudspeakers luckily don't pick up EMC or are immune to that. And imagine the wiring diagram for that. Uh, and then um, that's actually a myth about moths. Uh, so it's actually myths and moths. I mean, that speaker, actually, it wasn't moth. It was just age. It was a, a foam surround, and over 20 years, and that's all it was, completely disintegrated. Um, and that speaker was new in the box. <laughs> it was sat in a box, been hardly ever used, and it came out like that. It was a beautiful speaker, and, and the cabinets were fantastic, um, really solid and beautiful rosewood. Um, the weird thing is that when you play it, it actually sounded pretty good as long as you didn't turn the level up too much. But it actually sounded quite good. So, you know, what do I know? Okay. Um, Fortunately, you could buy the foam surround. Yes, you probably, well, yes. I think you probably could. Um, anyway, whatever. And I'll tell you what, if you put one of those in Hong Kong, it lasts about a week. I've never seen stuff disappear so quickly in tarnish. Anyway, um, the other thing is that... that you often find you go around and, and people think painting a loudspeaker is a good idea and um, helps disguise it. Well, it certainly disguises the audio, uh, if, if nothing else. I mean, these are re real photographs. Um, so painting a loudspeaker doesn't improve the tone. Um, we are going to go through some myths as we talk about this. And there's just another one, if you can see a loudspeaker. I mean, it's just unbelievable. OK, um, that's a really good way of of screwing up the audio. Because um, in fact, face masks actually act as a low pass filter, typically up to about a kilohertz, and then it goes, depending on the rate, depending on the type of mask you're using. So uh, certainly some of the medical masks, you don't get anything out above a kilohertz. So you've only got the low frequency, which makes life interesting in hospitals and things. OK, so let's get a little bit more technical. You'll be pleased to hear. Here is a very common chart that you see in quite a few textbooks showing the speech and frequency range 
uh, for speech and for music. Um, that's a total myth. I don't know what the book is. I mean, it shows speech and he goes up to about 3K. Well, speech is a lot wider than that. And yet, this came out of a very renowned reference book. Um, a less renowned reference book uh, produced that. But at least it's getting there. I mean, actually, the, sh the speech shape is correct, uh, the way that, that happens. But again, it only goes up to about 4, maybe 5K. Speech is much wider than that, as we're going to see. So that's a myth. What really goes on is something like that. Um, I didn't, sorry, I couldn't do a nice smooth graphic. I had to do it in Excel. Um, so those are real numbers. Um, but you can see it actually goes from about uh, 125 hertz up to 10K. So the speech range is certainly up to 10 kilohertz. There's still speech information at 10 kilohertz, despite rumors to the contrary. And in fact, you can see it if you measure a bunch of talkers, and there's their, uh, their spectra. This is the long-term spectra, taken over maybe 30 seconds or longer. Um, and just for reference, there's the old STI curve. Um, but you can see at low frequencies, most voices don't have the same amount of energy as the STI did, which is why it got changed in 2020 to a slightly different curve we'll, we'll see later on. So we dropped the, the LF content to match speech better. But often you will, almost in every case I've ever measured, there's more high frequency in the voice than the STI would suggest, which is why sometimes you can get a slightly higher STI value than you might expect because that's in there and is useful. We'll talk a bit about that a bit later on. Um, so there's a real speech spectrum <clears throat> in third octaves. This is, you can see it goes from 100 up to 16K. Um, I'm not so sure about the 80 hertz, if it was valid or not, and 20 kilohertz probably wasn't. This was a group of, uh, of 10 of my MSc students in the anechoic chamber, so I, I know the data's good, but I think we're into the noise floor up there. But you can see there's still information, there's still you know, valid information up to 16 kilohertz looking at the speech spectrum. Is there any intelligibility? That's a whole different question, which we may or may not address later on. Um, so, and this is a different set of uh, measurements. And what's interesting here, what I've done is, is to put underneath the kind of the envelope, uh, if you follow the top, so it's easier to see. And you can see in this case at 125 there's a peak, and four five hundreds, sorry, four or five hundred hertz there's a peak. This one is 500, that's 400. But that's very common. Um, so there's the maximum power, the maximum level from a voice is always around about four or five hundred hertz, um, which actually has some implications when we do measurements later on. But you can see, again, it goes up to 16K and then drops off in, in that case. And once we're up there, you know, was it the microphone was flat? How is it measured? And there was all sorts of queries. But you're going to see later on, there's still speech information up to 20 kilohertz, believe it or not. Now, does the speech spectra change with level? Because one of the things we don't think about when we're actually doing calculations and stuff is we assume the speech spectrum is the same. But actually, it does change a bit. Uh, not so much. Um, there are four different vocal levels. So the normal, this is at over 60, um, raised, loud, and then a shout. Clearly, the shout is different to the other ones. The other one you often see is whisper, but I don't think many people whisper into microphones on PA systems, so we, well, I ignored that. Um, it's easier to see the change, though, so I've normalized them, and there you can see them. Um, and this is, well, it's really interesting. It's really interesting. Um, well, I think it's interesting. Uh, you can see if you shout, the low frequencies decrease dramatically. There's a lot less low frequency. In fact, as you raise your voice, the low frequencies go down. There's the normal one. So they all drop. And also the high frequency changes slightly, um, depending on your voice level. So yes, spectrum does, does, does make a difference. But on the whole, it, it, it's not going to affect things too much. So you really don't need to think about it. But it's worth bearing in mind. And certain, certain applications, it's certainly worth knowing about. Um, and people say, well, you know, talk level is 60 dBA, for example. So, is that constant? I mean, do people actually speak at 60 dBA? Does it vary? You know, what does 60 dBA of speech really mean? 
And that has a huge impact on how we design systems. Um, so it's a myth. People don't talk at a constant level. It, it be it 60, 70, or 55. Um, it varies all over the shop. There's just, just five seconds um, of speech. And, there, and you'll see why it's five seconds later on. But you can see it's varying, you know, over time. We've got time this way, five seconds worth and level, and that's the max RMS. Um, and in fact, there's nearly a 15, 20 dB variation in the words and the syllables as you're speaking. So it's not constant, it varies. What we can do is to look at the spectrum of that, and funnily enough, it's the same piece of speech that I was using before for this one. But if we do a much more uh, dense spectrum, you know, a much higher resolution spectrum, you can see a bit more information. But you can still all see all the features. There's the peak at 125, there's the peak at 400, there's the peaks. You've got a peak here, around about a K, there's the peak there, there's the peak there, there's the peak there, and there's the dip. So it's just looking at the information. The trouble is, if you look at a plot like that, it's what do you do with it? There's too much information to handle. So actually a third octave is, is a pretty good way of actually seeing what's going on. Um, but we can do higher resolutions. It would be really neat if we could kind of combine the spectrum and the level at the same time. That would be quite a nice thing to be able to understand and see what's going on. Well, of course, you can do that. You can do a spectrograph. And that is the spectrograph of that bit of speech. You can see it across the top. And the reason I restricted it to five seconds was so we can actually see the spectrograph in detail. Otherwise, you, you just don't, it's a blur. Um, and this also shows quite nicely that the speech, the top of the plot there is actually 20 kilohertz. So you can still see there are indeed components going up to 20K in speech. This is just normal speech, nothing special about it. It's not being processed. It's actually straight recorded speech. But you can see how the pattern changes. So down here below a 1K, um, you've got these variations. Um, I won't go into F1 and F2 trans transitions, but, but it's quite different to obviously up here. And you can see at 4K, just for this particular voice, um, there is quite a change in the way that's, that those work. Um, basically, down here, those are the vowels and those are the consonants, putting it crudely. And there's an overlap between the two. So we can start to see what goes on. But you, know, you can really see there's clearly there's information up, up to 15K in, in there. Um, how important is it? We will maybe talk about just another way of doing it, um, slightly easier. There you can see all the vowels lumped around. There's, there's uh, 2K. Um, and then the high frequency. And the line actually is at 12K, which is on the spectrum plot here. You can still see the 16 is doing really well. And there was information at 20K on that. But you, you can't really use that. I mean, it's nice. And it's, you can see what's going on. But it's very difficult to quantify that. It's much easier to actually have a a time plot. So what does our 60 dBA really mean if you were talking about it? Um, I do apologize. I was not thinking right. I couldn't get the level to 60. It was 61.6 dB when I actually did the calculation at the end. So I'm hopefully you'll forgive me for 1.6 dB um, error. And I couldn't be asked to change it once I'd seen what I'd done. Um, so you can see there's the average level. It turns out to be 61 uh, dB. But you can see here. Uh, I'm not going to say peaks, I'm going to say the maximum RMS. This is sampling the speech every 100 milliseconds uh, to see what goes on. So it's a pretty fine resolution. And you can see it goes up there, and we have a 20 dB range, which I mentioned before um, in the thing. So yeah, 60 dB is not constant. It's varying all over the shop. And what is interesting is if you do a statistical analysis, a distribution of, of the sound, what goes on. And in fact, you can see that by far the biggest one is 57 to 58, uh, contributes more than 20, 21%. And in fact, 45% of the time, the level is above 61. And it was up, mm, about 46, 47, was below that. So just because it's 60, that's the average. But don't forget it's going to go up to much higher levels. So you know, 60 dB is, is a real misnomer. You know, yes, the average is 60, but it's like averages are, you know, is an average. You know, um, so just be careful when you're looking at speech. 
And at the end of the day, we're putting speech through sound systems, we're putting speech through assistive listening systems. We have to know what's going on. And to kind of put this in a little bit more perspective, the top is the 500 hertz. Again, we're sampling this every 100 milliseconds. And the red is the 8 kilohertz. So I've just looked at those two bands. I haven't displaced them. I haven't changed the gains. That is the actual relative amplitudes of those two components in that signal. So they are very different. And that's the other way around. So now you can hopefully see the 500 and there's the 8K sort of down there. Um, and again, there's about a 20 dB range of speech information when we're talking. The other thing is that they don't track each other, the 500 and the 8K. If you look at this carefully, yes, at the very start of a word, because you can see the gaps between the words here, they both go up together, but nowhere else do they do that. And that's because what, you know, the 500 is looking at vowels, and that's looking at consonants, and the two don't go together, generally speaking. So you don't often see that in books. I'm not surprised, because <laughs> but there we go. So it just gives you another handle on it. This is another way of looking at speech dynamics and the amplitude variations. Again, we take our familiar kind of spectrum. Um, and that is the maximum RMS. Okay, they're not peaks, they're the maximum RMS. There's a subtle difference. So it's an RMS signal, it a, has a time constant of 100 milliseconds in this case. Um, but you can see the maximum RMSs go up. And if you look at that carefully uh, with your binoculars from here, you'll see it's about 12 dB between them. It's not quite, it changes. And so to make that easier to see, I've, I've normalized them and taken one from the other. And you can see the average is, in fact, 12 dB. But at higher frequencies, then there's a bigger variation between the long-term average and the actual maximum that occurs uh, when we're speaking. So again, the consonants have changed a lot more than the vowels. You can see here the vowels actually are, are, are much more constant. Oh, OK. Said all that. Um, so let's put that into context. Let's put that into a system of some sort and what, what it really means. Let's take a hearing loop. Um, or another ALS, but I'll take a hearing loop. And in fact, let's take the same bit of speech. And hearing loops are weird because the 0 dB is actually a peak level, or a maximum level, I should say, rather than a long-term average, which everything else works on. Um, it used to be that way around, but it got changed uh, for reasons that are beyond my comprehension. Um, so the average level, basically, a hearing aid wants to see 70 dB. That's what it's set up for. So there's the 70 dB level. I put it in here, just out of argument. And, but when you're looking at a, the signal on the loop, it will peak up, for want of a better word, or it'll go up to a maximum, notionally of 0 dB. Um, as you can see, in this particular case, this is a particularly good talker. He has a pretty constant level. Um, it doesn't actually get to 0. The thing is, if you were looking at that loop and you actually looked at a, a measurement uh, of the field strength, you would never see it get up to zero, which is what you're expecting to see. And in fact, it only rarely will get to zero. So it's a bit of a strange thing to actually have a, a measurement that is hardly ever there, um, if you see what I mean. <laughs> Very strange. Um, but, but that's kind of how it works. <clears throat> but also, don't forget the real peaks. If we look at the real transient peaks that are going on, they're the orangey curve up here. They're going to be 20 dB higher, again, uh, than, than that. Um, so, but we're not measuring those when we're measuring a loop system um, because we're using a, a time constant of about 125 milliseconds. So, in fact, we will just see the zero. Um, but they are there, and basically, they will either get limited or chopped. Does it matter? Not really. You can certainly knock 6 to 8 dB off those peaks, and nobody would know the difference. Uh, once you start getting down into this area, then you start to maybe hear some differences. And you've got to clip it pretty hard before you really start the distortion getting in. But certainly the true peaks 
Um, yes, if you do an A-B test, you can hear a difference. But if you just heard them clean, you wouldn't know how that had been there. Ooh, okay. So we've done all that stuff. Yeah, and there's, sorry, in that curve is the, there's the, the zero. So again, we've got all these peaks sitting above our notional zero dB level. And I think that's a lot of, a lot of people set up loops so they're actually almost too loud because they're expecting to see, you know, the LED or the needle or whatever go over and, and go beyond zero. So, oh, we're going a bit more than zero. That seems very mean, you know, so let's get plus three or something. Well, depending on, you know, how you're measuring it and what you're doing, um, you could be really overdriving the thing. Um, and then we, it's the same really with a 100 volt line signal and amplifier signal. I'll, I'll go with 100 volt line because it's a nice, it's, it's easier in a way. Um, so again, let's in this case, I've taken a level of 82 dBA as our sound level that we're going to work with, most more sensible than the other ones. Um, but in fact, you can see that the, the maximum RMS will actually get to 91. So 910 above the long-term average um, to get that. And, you know, then you start thinking about it in terms of volts. What does that really mean? Okay. And also, although it's 82 dBA, the amplifier doesn't think in dBA terms. It's linear. It thinks linear. It doesn't wait what comes into it. It just waits for it. Um, so in fact, in terms of the amplifier, it thinks it's seeing levels of up to 95 dB. And that's what your calculation should be really worked on, because that's the real level. A weighting is just a thing that we invented. Electrons don't know it's going through an A weighting filter. They don't care less. You know, they want to see a nice linear thing. They know when it distorts and they hit the end and they, they run out of headroom. Uh, we can see what we've seen what happens to that. So um, again, it's, it's worth knowing that if you're A-weighting speech, you are really be careful because you're going to be at least 5 or 6 dB lower than you think or higher, depending on which way you, you kind of look at that. Um, and that means you're going to have to have a voltage that's probably 4 or 5 times higher than you thought you needed to actually get through clean. And that's without the crest factor. You know, I haven't looked at peaks. People talk about crest factor. Well, that's the crest factor. And the crest factor on speech is typically 18 to 20 dB. But as I say, really the peaks, so what? You know, you've chopped that lot off. It makes no difference. So having a crest factor of 18, the only time that's important is if you're doing sort of like studio broadcasts or broadcast work or something like that in a PA system. It doesn't matter. But uh, you certainly, when you're doing um, high quality recording, broadcast, or whatever, then you need to be aware of that 20 dB crest factor. And it's true. And that's pretty universal. Every person I've measured, um, it's always between about 18, and 18 to 20 dB uh, in, in thing. If you measure it A-weighted versus linear, you get a slightly different answer. Um, but well, I'm not going to go into that. It gets way too complicated. Um, so again, if we now put the, the real peaks into that, it does that. And let's put some volts on there. So let's say we've got a digital amplifier and it goes, I can go to 100 volts for no more, which is what they tend to do these days. You know, in the old analog days, we could, get, ooh, we could squeeze a lot more than 100 volts out of an amplifier. Um, but these days, with a digital, you've got to have a limited thing. So you've got to allow this lot. So to get our 82 dBA out, um, that's only sitting here at about 22 volts uh, on average. But we've got to allow 100 volts to get through the system. Because we're interested, the amplifier is interested in the peak level, we're interested in the long-term RMS, because that's where the loudness is. There's no loudness in these individual peaks. It's in the RMS long-term level. And that's, that's where the confusion sometimes gets, is that we really do need to look at the long-term for loudness, but we need to look at the peak excursion in terms of number of volts you know, the amplifier can drive. Okay. Um, so, you know, we really ought to allow 12 dB headroom uh, for that. 12 dB has cropped up several times already. 
wonder why. Okay. Um, and again, the other thing is, you I often see 100 volt lines, and they're constant voltage. Well, they're not. They're nothing like constant voltage. You've just seen it running all over the bloody shop. Why, who on earth came up with constant voltage? I have no idea. They must have been on the same thing that I was on um, a while ago, because uh, I, I don't get that. The signal is not constant, and systems don't operate at 100 volts either. They're sitting probably down at about 30, 20 to 30 is where most PA systems will actually sit if they're not clipping. They can get to 100, but only on the peaks, only on the maximums. Right, that's done that. Um, let's change the topic slightly. Uh, STI is a measure of speech intelligibility. Well, that's a myth. Ooh, look at that. I don't you like that one. No, STI is not a measure of speech intelligibility. It is a measure of the potential intelligibility of a system. STI does not measure speech. It does not measure the intelligibility of speech, although a lot of people think it does. It is measuring purely an electroacoustic path and seeing what goes on. It correlates quite nicely, but it ain't measuring speech. So that's a myth. Uh, and if we look at the intelligibility, the information content of speech, uh, there's a graph I took from a training manual from a very well-known organization. Um, now, all of the maths geniuses in the room will have immediately spotted that that's a myth. And, and for the sake of argument, a math genius today is only anybody who can count up to 100. Um, I think that is, covers it quite well, really. Um, I, I, well, no, anyway. Um, because if you look at that lot, it adds up to more than 100. So you can't have more than 100% intelligibility. Um, so clearly, that's a myth. What they were trying to do was actually do something more like that. That's the STI weighting. Um, yes, there's a lot of information around about the 2K. And in fact, uh, in that weighting curve, 2K is certainly pre predominant. But equally, the 500, 1K, and 4K are equally important. And in STI terms, the 8K is actually remarkably important. And down here at the sort of 125, 250, it doesn't really matter. So you can, you, that's why you can chop those off, and you don't really affect intelligibility. And in fact, you know, a reverberant cathedral or something, if you chop the low end off, you make it more intelligible because you remove the masking and all that information is still there. So you haven't done any harm. It just sounds maybe not as good. Okay, so that's clear cut. Or is it? Well, no, because there's another measure of intelligibility that's equally well researched as STI. And it has a different set of weighting curves. And this one, actually, the 500 hertz, says it's much more important than all the others, which comes as an interest. So are they both right? And then look at the 8K. It says, no, 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 I'm not worried about 8K. Nah, forget that. Don't need to get that. But my God, you've got to get the 500 through. But otherwise, it's sort of these frequencies up here, they're, they're pretty similar. They, they follow a similar curve. So what's going on? Um, I'm going to go to that curve. It's easier to see. So now I've swapped to third octaves because you can see it happily. And the difference is, one of those weight relates to how we speak normally, i.e. speech, connected speech. And the other one is when we're doing word tests, the way we weight the information is completely different. The way the brain assesses that information is completely different. So doing a word test is very useful. And for, for diagnostic purposes, it's very good. It has nothing to do with the way the system was used for speech in, in the real world. Well, that comes as a bit of a shock to people. You know, why aren't they the same, and why is that radically different? In running speech, in real speech, 500 hertz is incredibly important, um, as you, you can see. You can also see there's information all the way up to sort of 10K. It's reduced, but it's still, still there. Um, as again, it shows because speech goes up to 10K. So again, you know, you can do word tests, you get one result, you do real speech, you get a different test, you can get a different result. That's part of the reason. It's, it's more complicated than that. The way the brain does stuff is quite difficult, it's quite different. 
You can put the same word in a sentence and you'll get a different score with that sentence if, if that word was not in that sentence. Um, so that's why intelligible, I find intelligibility incredibly interesting and incredibly frustrating because you never know where you are with it. Um, everybody's different. So um, another question for you. STI mimics a speech signal. Where have I heard that? Okay. Um, when is it a chore or is it a myth? Let's have a look, see what it does. Um, well, there's the, the Frink's response or the spectral response for STI. That's the old one, the blue, which we saw before. And there's the newer one, 2020, which knocks off the low frequencies, as I said. So that better mimics um, the spectral content of real speech, as you can see there. Um, OK, yes, there's more high frequency information in real speech. Um, the reason those slopes were chosen, they're 6 dB per octave, which makes filters a lot easier to, to make. And also, there's a big variation. So if you take an average, you, are, you know where you are with it, but it can underestimate the high frequency content uh, of a system or speech. What about the dynamics? What about the time? Well, there's some real speech. And you can see you get little bursts of energy. Uh, you, there's, a, there's a word gap there. You get gaps between syllables. You don't get that in the STI signal. That's continuous. So they are quite different. Does that matter? Well, that's some real speech, and there's the STI signal on the same thing. All right? Real speech is all over the shop. You can see it varies from time. With time, it varies with amplitude. It varies with frequency. STI just sits there going, eh, blah, I'm not changing. It doesn't change the amplitude as it goes through. It's completely different. I mean, I think that, that really does show the difference. So. STI is great, it's the best thing we've got, but there are some limitations, and those are some of the reasons that we get this limitation. And then if you obviously jiggle around, so what I'm going to do is compare STI uh, signal with the real speech, that's the one we've seen before. And on the right-hand side here is the STI signal. Now, you actually need to increase the STI by signal by 3 dB to equate them. A lot of people don't do that, but you, that's, it's in the standard. It says it in black and white. You increase the SDI, the steeper signal, by 3 dB to get a match. And in fact, you can see here at the peaks, these are the true peaks. It does actually match up reasonably well. Um, that's just a different view of it. The RMS is different. You can see that it's got, it doesn't vary as we've just seen like the other one. So it's not going to exercise a system in the same way. Compressors aren't going to work in the same way. Or any other dynamic processing cannot work in the same way as to real speech. So therefore, depending on what they're doing, you know, what are you measuring? But so, um, yeah, STI is halfway to speech. The modulations are correct. The spectrum is pretty correct but the dynamics are completely wrong uh, when we're doing it. You can kind of see it there. Here's a nice one. Women have better hearing than men. Oh, no, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> we could take a vote on that, couldn't we? Um, yeah, all right. I used to have selective deafness. A lot of men do. Uh, and you hear certain things. Um, well, it's kind of truish, actually, depending how you define better hearing. Um, let's look at sort of hearing loss with age. Uh, men and there's the male and female curves. These are in international standards, so it's it's you know all, all good data. Um, and you can see that the male curves are a lot sharper. There's a lot more drop off. A lot more high frequency information is lost than with females. And in fact, I've plotted the two out, so you can see that's the fifty. Uh, age group, and males are 6 to 8 dB less. You know, well, they have more hearing loss, shall we say, and therefore they hear less. So I, I think on that basis you could say that females may hear better, the, better than men, but there's a lot more to it than that, but it just gives you a, a feel for it. Um, here's another one. Our ears are most sensitive sounds from the front. That sure is that a myth. I don't know. I don't know, Pete. You're going to tell us? Yes, I will tell you. <laughs> OK, so it's a myth. Um, and we're doing something else. Oh, no, OK, I'll better explain that. OK, if we actually look at the polar of an ear, or, or the head and the ear, um, 
zero is so they're facing forward, and that's so you can see here the left ear. You can see it lobes out around about 45 degrees. And if you look at somebody's head and the ears, they're actually shaped forwards and they're actually pointing out at about 45 degrees. So it's totally logical, totally physical. Um, and it's a frequency effect. At lower frequencies, 500 and below, you know, it, it doesn't happen. That. That's the head. Um, so at higher frequencies, certainly sounds coming from the sides are much more, we're much more sensitive to it. Uh, this was another measurement I did because I'd, I'd lost the frequency grasp for that. And again, it shows the same basic pattern um, that it's lobing out, especially at about 2 kilohertz, it's lobing out at 45 degrees. So that's kind of true. Um, but is sound arriving from the front more intelligible? I screwed up my PowerPoint now, I've given you the answer. <laughs> um, I wonder. <laughs> well, I think the chances are it is, actually. <laughs> yeah, so although we're not as sensitive in terms of hearing, uh, sounds, in terms of intelligibility, yeah, we're actually more sensitive from the front. Um, and certainly that's true um, in terms of, of, of the rear. Let's go back to that. Um, I did some interesting experiments with my students again this last year. Um, and we had them face different directions, and we looked at the intelligibility under various conditions. And sure enough, from the front was the highest intelligibility. From the back was noticeably significantly lower. And from the top was also lower, um, slightly. So just the way the ear and the powders work and some of that work was part of that. So it's an interesting thought when you're actually designing systems as to where the speakers are. There will be an effect. Okay. What about this one? Intelligibility improves the louder the sound gets. I've heard that so many times. Turn it up and it'll all be wonderful and everything else. Well, once you've you know, at least got a minimum SNR, signal to noise ratio, uh, that's true. so it's a myth. In fact, the reverse is true. Um, optimally, speech should be between about 55 and 80 dB, dBA, don't mind. Lower than 55, your ear is not hearing it as well as it should do. Above 80, uh, there's some distortion mechanism, and in fact, your ear actually will hear lower intelligibility. Um, nothing to do with systems, this is the ear doing it. So you want to be between 55 and 80. You're going, yeah, but okay, but the, the ambient noise is 80, so I've got to be at 90 or whatever it is. Well, that's true. That's a different issue. But in general terms, um, once you go above 80, you, your, the intelligibility decreases. And STI does exactly the same thing. It actually mimics it. So in fact, actually, that's probably the curve you often see um, you can see once you go above 80, then the STI goes down. Um, but that's only true in an anechoic chamber, or maybe outside. Um, and I haven't designed many sound systems for anechoic chambers over the years. I've designed a few, but not many. Um, so, and that's the curve there. So that's the top of this curve. Now, in fact, if we go to sort of half a second and one second RT, you can see the effect is much less. It's still there. You, you have less intelligibility above 80, but the, the effect of it is, is, is less marked. And once you're into really reverberant spaces, um, then in fact, that reduces further. So if you're in a really reverberant railway station and you turn the level up, in fact, the intelligibility probably will improve because uh, you're going to get much better signal noise ratio. And it, so you've lost that point. So that's something that's not many people know that. Um, but that's the curve that you always see in the books and everywhere else. Um, but it's only true <laughs> under zero RT conditions, i.e. in an anechoic chamber. Um, speaking of that, therefore, is reverberation time a predictor of speech intelligibility? In other words, if you've got one, two, four, five, six seconds RT, you can predict what the intelligibility is going to be. Uh, it's a myth. Um, there's no specific relationship between RT and speech intelligibility. None whatsoever. There's a general relationship, is the longer the RT, then the worse the intelligibility will be. But there's no specific relationship between them at all. Oh, the other one, this, this just is a bugbear. 
Okay, there's no such parameter as RT60. You see this all over the place in very learned manuals of information. You see the RT60 was this. No, it wasn't. There is no such parameter as RT60. This is a, a thing that came out of America in the 70s. And just everybody took it on without thinking about it. Um, you can have RT, you can have T60, you can have T30, you can have T20. But you can't have RT60. It's, it's total tautology. RT is the time it takes for the sound to decay by 60 dB. That's what the 60 is telling you. So you don't need RT60. So we're saying we're actually measuring the reverberation time over 60 dB for 60 dB. You know, no. That's the Americans for you. Oh, I didn't say that. Right. Now then, into more myth-busting, maybe. Um, we need a signal-to-noise ratio of greater than 10 dB for intelligibility. Um, that's said a lot. It's even said in some standards. But it's completely not a myth. I'll bet I'll show you why. Um, this is out of uh, BS 5839. It's even in the 2023 edition. And 10 dBA is measured, uh, sorry, is mentioned several times. The wording did get changed slightly. Um, so only use the 10 dBA for initial design purposes. And it may not be adequate, or it may be overkill. I wonder who I did that. Um, but up until then, it was a rigid 10 dB uh, requirement. No, absolute rubbish. Let's have a look. Oh, and even on the ANS, it's got to do 10 dB. I mean, it's not a good. It's, it's a good starting point, you know. Uh, but um, under some conditions, 10 dBA will actually cause you noise nuisance issues, and in other conditions, it isn't going to be enough. Um, you really do need to look at what you're doing. You need to understand speech. You need to understand a hell of a lot before you actually make those comments. Um, so, is it myth or magic? Well, I've already told you. Um, when I started in this business, sort of like, um, what, three or four years ago, I suppose. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, decades ago. <laughs> um, it was 6 dB was the rule. You, you, want, you went for 6 dB. 10 suddenly appeared from nowhere and became universal. And I, sometime in the 80s or 90s, I don't know when or where it came from, but it was, suddenly became 10 dB. Um, with no justification, it just became the number and we went for it. I'm not saying it's not better, but is it needed? And that's the question. I thought that was because 10 dB was presumed to be twice as loud. Yeah. I think that it came from the loudness curve, is what I was told. Could have done. Mind you, 10 dB being twice as loud is a, is a point. I, I was, I'm not going to talk about that today. No, no, but sure, a, but as a... Yeah, yes, as a general rule, thing. that's true. That's absolutely true. Yeah, but why does it suddenly change from six? Oh, I don't know. Way before my time. If anybody knows, I'd be fascinated to, to um, know where that came from. You can track it um, into the previous BS5839, the first one. Um, so into there. Um, anyway, that's what it says. So do we need 10 dB? Or should it always be 10 dB? Um, as I say, in some cases it's total overkill, in other cases it's not enough. Um, let's have a look at a few. And interesting for hearing loops and ALS, we need 20. So, hang on, why the rules changed? Ah, we'll have a look later on. Um, so, these numbers are not constant. So, let's assume for the moment that we've got no RT, in other words, we're in an anechoic chamber, um, then in fact, 0 dB signal noise ratio will give you 0.5. Now, you've got to get the spectrum right, and there's some other sort of things in there, but in theory, it will give you 0 dB. So, and 6 dB signal noise ratio will give you 0.7, and 10 dB will give you 0.83. I think that's a bit of overkill. Um, so, you know, but is it mythical? Is it only really achieved in anechoic chambers? Um, it is achieved in anechoic chambers, because I just wanted to prove the point. Um, but what about real life? Okay, so what I did was to 
do measurements in 15 different rooms with a wide range of RTs to, and then change the signal noise ratio and measure the STI just to see what happened because that's the sort of brain I have. Uh, sad, but never mind. Um, so we did 15 rooms going from 0.22, which isn't an anechoic chamber, uh, up to 4.6 seconds, which is certainly not an anechoic chamber. Um, that's actually a cathedral. And there's the RTs. Those are the mid-frequency RTs. So we've got quite a range. There's a lot sitting here at about 0.5 to 1 because that's a lot of rooms that I was working in. And they're very common uh, type of room to work in. So they're there, but we've gone the whole range. OK. And I set 0.5 STI as the criterion. What SNR did we need to get to 0.5? This is maths. So I'll explain the, the equation for you, so oh, maybe not. <laughs> um, you just have to take my word I did the maths right. OK, so let's have a look at the results. There's my 0.5, there are my rooms, and there's 6 dB. And in some of the rooms, I didn't get 0.5, I got 0.4. And in some of these rooms here, I actually got 0.7, 0.75. But we've got to have 10. OK. So what happens with 10? Well, it gets better. Oh, come on. Um, now the 10 is in the green. So I didn't put the line in, never mind. Did I? Yes, good. Wonderful. Um, so now we're up into the 0.83s up here uh, with 10 dB. And you can see that that one nearly got to 0.5. That one got to 0.5. Um, but these still at 10 dB don't get to 0.5 STI. So, you know, almost one bother. Um, and that's clearly overkill. So, it's, it's an interesting rule of thumb, and it's a good design start point, but there is nothing universal about it. There's nothing that should be set in stone about it. It's just a number. Anyway, there's something to think about. How are we doing? Peter, you're breaking the rules as a presenter. I'm also breaking the rules as the chair, and I've let you overrun. Oh, have I? So oh, I right. don't know if you want to... I thought I got, an, I thought I got two hours. Sadly not. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I got an hour, actually. I, is, I there a, is there a convenient place to stop, or...? Well, in a minute. OK, sure. <laughs> you, you've got to get the piece to resist. I, 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 I can skip all that because that's really quite boring math stuff. Um, and it kind of shows it works in, in other situations. There's the one for assistive listening, um, which shows that we need actually 15 dB signal noise ratio if you're going to try and get 0.7, which is the requirement for assistive listening system, which is why we really need 20. Because in these cases, you never get there. You, you can see it's, it's quite important. Um, that's another one. Ooh, I'm going to miss these because I want to get to something rather more interesting. Um, right, I'm going to talk about an experiment I did. I took a hoover into the anechoic chamber while I was measuring all the other stuff. I thought, take the hoover in, why not? Hoover the wedges. Um, so, and then I put a sound source, a proper one, um, at one end, and I actually measured 90 dB going into the hoover. There, you can see the 90. And then I measured it at the other end, at the back side, and I got 10. Um, I got 10 because that's the noise floor of the meter. So we got 90 going in, 10 coming out. So that really does prove that sound <laughs> doesn't go through a vacuum. <laughs> that isn't a myth. It's absolutely true. And on that happy note, I think I'll leave you to it. So thanks very much. Peter, as entertaining as always, thank you very much indeed. Um, it, we could have a question, if there is one burning question. Oh, we have a couple. OK, so we're going to come over to Doug first, please. Uh, Peter, can, can uh, Peter, you mentioned in the intelligibility standards that the STI is a continuous signal. Is there any work going on in the standards? 
sense to make it more like a real speech signal to chop it up? No. Um, <clears throat> that, that imposes a whole different uh, sense of errors that, that if you do that. Um, the, the, the SDI signal has the right modulations, which is the real critical part of why it kind of works. It has the right, notionally the right spectrum. Um, every individual will be different. So if you listen to a particular person talking or a particular announcer, it will be different anyway. So it follows those two primary requirements. And by increasing the level by 3 dB, that actually does compensate for the gaps, pretty much. Because if you measure the, the gaps in speech, and make them continuous, in other words, you, you get about a 3 dB rise. Is, is it exercising AGC? Ah, oh, no. Now, that's a whole different ball game. No, as I'm saying, the, the, the STI does not exercise AGC's compressors in the same way. Um, and at one point, one of the early kind of things said, oh, well, you should exclude all those, you bypass them. Well, no, you can't. That's part of the system. Um, just as EQ is part of the system, you can't do that. So... No, it's an interesting thought. Where intelligibility measurement is going is maybe a subject for a different day, um, but it gets a bit hairy. So the quick answer is no. That's a myth. <laughs> no, this is the last one. So we've got one final question over there, please. We've got the next hour. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me answer this sort of fairly quickly. Um, yes, as a non native speaker, you will struggle with um, it, doesn't matter what language, you know, if it's Polish to Italian or English to whatever, you know. Um, if you're a non native speaker, and by that, even if you're fluent, in the language, you will still struggle. You do not hear the sounds in the same way as somebody who's brought up in that. And basically, maybe up to about the age of seven, after that is when the, the, the changes start to occur. And in fact, even in the STI standard, it, it says you need a requirement of at least 0.1 to 0.15 more to actually be in the equivalent level uh, of your you know, native counterparts. So in other words, if it was 0.5, you would need about 0.65 to have the equivalent as a non-native speaker. Um, it's the same, actually, funny enough, with talkers as well. They, they kind of, similar thing. So if you've got a you non-native know, talker, you need to increase the STI to that. Um, and guess, and noise is the most sort of common detractor from intelligibility. So yes, you increase the signal-to-noise ratio. So in fact, yeah, all those graphs are a load of rubbish I just showed you, because you do need 10 dB if you're not a native speaker. That's, that's a good point, actually. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, STI has been checked with Western European languages. Um, so any, any, any Western European language, it works. Um, it doesn't work with Hawaiian. Um, I had to take a trip all the way out to Hawaii just to check. <laughs> <laughs> um, or somebody had to do it. And it doesn't work with one of the Chinese, uh, Mandarin, Cantonese. It works with Mandarin. It doesn't work with Cantonese, uh, for example. And there's some other ones. I'm not sure about Arabic. I have my suspicions about Arabic at the moment, but that's for a different reason. So, yeah. So, but, but basically, any sort of, of those Western languages, it kind of works. And there are variations. And if you take Italian, in fact, the syllable rate is much higher. You, you need to look at it and maybe increase the level as well. So... 
the trouble is, you know, you're trying to make a general rule and a general system for an incredibly complicated issue. I mean, intelligibility is incredibly complicated. And we only, st we still don't understand some bits about it. Um, you know, so we're getting there. And in fact, the fact that STI works at all, frankly, is quite amazing. Uh, it really is, you know, it, but it does give you a pretty good uh, correlation. Uh, I'm sorry, would you mind taking one more of Peter? Are you all right? Because I'm absolutely No, that's absolutely that. fine. Ooh. Very last question, please. Yeah, it's going to be really quick. Thank you so much for a very interesting speech. Uh, it's just one question, which is if I want to, because I have a million questions probably about this, and if I want to delve in deeper into your research, uh, do you have any recorded lectures or research papers or anything you have to um, myself? We, we can talk afterwards, but. I think I've written something like 200 papers and articles on intelligibility or sound system design over the, the years, and there's 10 book chapters uh, that kind of relate to that topic as well. So, yeah, somewhere in there. It depends what aspect. Let's have a chat afterwards, and I can kind of maybe point you. Um, the last one was in 2022, yes, and I was quite pleased with that one on, on intelligibility. It was quite a good chapter. I was quite pleased with that, sort of put everything together into it. So, yeah, there is stuff out there. Um, you know, I haven't published the jokes. You'll be sad to me. <laughs> well, you have now, I really. Can't, I can't think <laughs> They're on why. the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, well, look, it's time, really, for us to get back over to that marquee and have some lunch. Lunch has been really good the last few years, hasn't it? So I'm expecting great things. Um, <laughs> Um, do make time, please, to go and have a look at our exhibitors. And, of course, there will be the presentations. So if we're lucky, we may see some stunned fish as well as they're surprised with some kind of award or accolade. So please go and enjoy your lunchtime. And I'll see everybody back here at half past two. And to our online people, have a lovely lunch break. See you then. Huge thanks to Peter again, please. Thank you.